Vets are usually the first place that dog owners look to for information. I was curious to know how much dog behavior and dog training education veterinarians receive while they're in school. Um, but still, worldwide, it's exceptional that veterinary specialists and behavior are on faculty of vet schools. Worldwide, it's exceptional. Um, and yet, the single biggest killer of pet dogs and cats are behavior problems. You know, we haven't made big strides in veterinary behavior. There are no more specialists at vet schools now than when I did my residency, and that's an indictment of um, veterinary medical education. Um, I think that this is the one specialty that actually ties all the others together because when the animal is, um, you know, in renal failure and the clients are willing to have the treatment, if you can't get near the animal, you're not going to treat the animal. So vets don't even understand that this is costing them money. And in part of the problem in the United States is our litigious environment. People are so afraid of being sued if they try to help a dog who might be afraid and maybe growls at somebody that they um, might recommend not treating that dog at all. And it becomes a problem because in, for example, Australia, specialists are told to always recommend that people consider euthanasia for most behavior problems as a way to prevent them from being sued for any type of um, aggressive event that the animal might have. So for any dog who is aggressive at all, they are recommended that they write on their discharge forms, um, you should seriously consider euthanasia, which is just to me insane. But that's what litigation has done. So you can sort of see how that also wouldn't help a lot with getting people to teach more about this in schools. The one way behavior is beginning to be taught um, to more veterinarians is part of welfare. So, you know, as the European has stronger welfare statutes for many things, you're beginning to see behavior showing up in a lot of welfare courses. It's always been a big part of welfare, but that's sort of the back door. But people need to realize that vets don't actually know that much about problematic behavior or even maybe normal behavior. And it's the minority of vet schools in North America that have any program in it at all. And it's the minority of those programs that train residents and train specialists. So you're still, you know, 20 years down the road, we still have fewer than 50 specialists in the United States. And a large chunk of those are actually retired because they were the people who started out the field. So this is a, this is a real problem. And the other real problem that is a little different um, in Europe and the United States is an awful lot of their veterinary specialists also do research, which is not true in the United States. We tend not to think that way. Um, we don't do a lot of research. So um, a lot of our veterinarians are um, not thinking as scientifically as they could. We do a lot of continuing education, but we don't have the great number of small research-based meetings where there's also um, a role for traditional vets. It's, it's, a, it's a very different environment. So we're still um, at the stage where we're considering implementing breed-specific legislation while many European countries are realizing that their breed-specific laws didn't work and now they're looking at other ways to do that. With the unprecedented access to information about legitimate dog behavior and training, and vets being the figureheads in the dog community, why do we still have a gap in the education system for veterinarians? Why do we still have that disconnect in the education system? I think because um, we have that disconnect in human medicine also. Psychiatrists um, are one of the lowest paid specialties in human medicine. So it's, it's a disconnect, it's a problem. Um, in veterinary medicine, I can tell you that the, the level of the problem is actually um, largely a financial and administrative one. Um, the veterinarians themselves know they want the help. And in fact, um, vet behavior clubs spring up at most vet schools. They're usually student driven. I can't tell you the number of vet schools um, to which I've gone and given talks based on student invitations. 
Um, if you go to anybody's continuing education talks, doesn't matter if it's mine or Sophia Young, um, or you go to you know any one of my other colleagues' talks, doesn't matter who's giving the talk, room's full. And the room's full because as soon as you get out of school, you realize that you desperately need this help. And you've got to get the stuff that you didn't get while you were in school. So the vets understand this. And in many cases, they've gone, at least two cases that I know of, they've gone back as alumni to their universities and said, we really need to have a behavior position here. And the universities always say that they don't have the money because if they have to choose between having a dermatologist and a behaviorist, they're going to choose the dermatologist. For reasons that are completely obscure to me because they're worried about growing their next population of patients. Um, if we want to grow our next population, the way we have to do it is to keep as many dogs in that clinic and cats in that clinic alive as possible. You invest now, you grow that population. It's the same philosophy of you know getting people to go to museums and support the arts, and, and yet notice those are all the things that are suffering because people don't see the immediate now thing. There's another problem with vets. They're um, walking around with the same misapprehensions about behavior and problem behaviors that the average person is because they started out as the average person. And that's that there are millions of animals who need homes being killed every day who don't have problems. Why keep a problem pet? But there aren't those animals. The single biggest reason people relinquish animals to a shelter is a behavioral problem. So, and when you look at dogs who have been in a shelter and they come into another family, they often have a behavioral problem. And now it's worse, because getting abandoned actually made it worse. No small surprise. So this idea that there are healthy animals out there and that we, you know, we can just sort of have disposable animals that are psychologically damaged is also um, a long-held myth. And it's a myth. And we need to let go of that, too. Um, the other thing is that vets think they can't make money during behavior. I had to argue for some of the courses I teach at North American um, Veterinary Conference, both their main conference and their institute, which is perhaps the best continuing education meeting for vets in the United States every year. The most um, forethinking they've had behavior from the time I was a resident, they've had behavior on the program. You know, um, people who have created that conference or they're, they've got it. They understand everything I just said to you and more. And then there was the getting trainers involved issue. And that to them was not something that was acceptable because they've only seen people who sort of made it up as they go along. But that doesn't have to be the case. So when we got some trainers who have advanced training, who are competent, involved, and the vets have found out how much the trainers made. They were appalled <laughs> because they're not making that kind of money. And that's actually a lever because you can now work with trainers and everybody can grow that population. And that's what we now see the people who went through these courses. Guess what they work with? They've got trainers. That, and, they, and boy, do they interview these trainers because guess what? Now they can because now they know what they're doing too, and they know what the literature is. And they're not just gonna take, you know, the guy from Barkbusters, you know, the chain, we're gonna give you 10 minutes of information and you're gonna use that for everything, which is the chain approach to treating something. You know, they're gonna wanna know where you got your training, are you certified by any of these organizations, what do you do for continuing education, do you have an advanced degree, how do you handle these things, can I come watch, can, will you come here and do demonstrations, how are you gonna help interact with my staff? And they ask all those questions, so they work with the best of the best. So it's a market that just isn't tapped, and it's not tapped because people don't know about these things. And I always think, that, um, that vets and deans get it, but um, they don't until I give them this lecture. And then they do, but then they've usually gone, 
a lot of inertia, especially in this economy, to overcome. There really is a huge need for education about legitimate dog behavior and education, not only for professionals, but for dog owners. And can you just, just speak to that, why it's so important that we get legitimate information? Sure. Yeah, getting le knowing what information is legitimate is difficult for the average human. Consumer Reports has actually made an industry of this, and that doesn't exist here. Um, I, I'm actually angry that so many companies and uh, so many television personalities have gotten so much on the cheap because you're only trusted as a veterinarian because you have a license. What people may not realize, or they may, they may realize, is that first sort is done for them. You have to pass an exam. You know, you don't just go to vet school and get to practice. You have to pass an awful exam. And if you pass it, you get a license. And not everybody who goes to vet school actually does that. We would hope that our veterinary education is good enough that failures are exceptional, and they are. But it gives you a minimum guarantee about some knowledge base. And the way my assistant used to explain it to people when they would say, well, why can't I use, you know, whatever corporate barkbusters, whatever guy who came to the door, and why do I have to see Dr. Overall? And they would say, well, you know, she has an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, a PhD, she has a veterinary degree, she went through a residency program, she took the, the certification exam to be a specialist, and of course passed that, and she's certified by the Animal Behavior Society. And all of this was 15 years of training, whereas the trainer stopped at Kinko's on the way home and had a business program. You know? And that's what corporate approaches to these things tend to do. You know, they're, they're selling a business. They're not giving you the quality information you need. And right now, there's not a really good set of filters where people even know that there is quality information. They don't know there's a difference. And the second somebody like National Geographic or the Discovery Channel or Animal Planet puts something on, you immediately make that individual into an expert. So what's happened is, and the reason I'm angry, is you've devalued what it means to be an expert. You've devalued my 15 years of advanced training. Um, you know, I may not always be right, but I made every effort to have the information that would allow me to make a proper decision. These other venues made every effort to get you to buy their product. And you're buying a product when you watch Animal Planet, or the Discovery Channel, or National Geographic, or any of those. You know, you're buying a product, you're buying that TV product, you're buying that advertising. There now is a movement that's actually being quite effective in England um, to, to change some of this. And um, they've provided on um, a website a set of open source resources where you can get information um, for the Dog Welfare Project, which is, you know, the anti-dominance. Yes. Um, anything that we write like this, you know, my protocols are all in the public domain. Um, my, our research website actually posts our stuff. In the United States, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior has done a, a really good job of coming as close as is possible to an open source resource for people who want basic information on how to choose a trainer or how to house train your dog or why dominance is um, a false concept and will not help your dog and might injure you and your dog. Um, and you can go to their website and they have position statements that have that information. But we're not doing the kind of job of getting the information out that those exist that we need to be doing. And that to me is the single biggest problem. The American Humane Association says that they are going to, um, they've just created an advisory board on behavior and training. They say that they're going to try to act as um, a clearinghouse for some of these things. I'm on that board. We'll see. God knows we need one. 
you know, the Animal Behavior Resource Institute, which is R.K. Anderson's organization, has tried to do that. You can download huge numbers of videos and handouts and things online, but again, not getting the press, because you could take all of these groups together and they don't have the power that Animal Planet Earth Discovery Channel or National Geographic. Well, you know, I'll tell you something. Um, as somebody who has only one currency and it's information, because that's all academia gives you, you know, that's really, that's really what your neurosurgeon is selling. And the plate that goes in your head to stop your brain from falling out. But the only way that that plate becomes valuable is with his knowledge or her knowledge. You know, look at the, the wellness issues. How many, how many conditions could we prevent? if people did the basic preventative stuff, but it's information. You know, so we tend to devalue information, and it's crazy because it's the only thing we should value is quality information. It's the thing that keeps you alive, and the thing that keeps you healthy, and the thing that protects you, and it's the thing that, whether we want to think of it or not, keeps us all safe in a warlike situation. Um, what stops us from attacking something? So there are, lots of, there are lots of ways to make information more palatable. I think that the people who best communicate it are people with common sense, because you can say it simply. Now, that isn't to say it isn't sexy. Um, when I explain the molecular basis of learning to people, they find it tremendously sexy, and it's incredibly complex, and it is the cutting-edge series of questions in neuroscience right now. And everybody can have some ownership of that. Because you don't have to be able to go into the genome lab and use any of the equipment to understand how important it might be to turn on genes that are involved in that. So I think that we've done ourselves a disservice and we need to um, fight back. We are injured when the same things that work against us work for somebody else. You mentioned the Caesar Milan phenomenon. What makes that so appealing is the personal folksiness and the ability to be good in those situations. Well, now when you add that to a level of knowledge, it would be even more potent. But the people who have the knowledge often don't understand how important the ability to come across like that can be. And Charisma is incredibly important, and the um, those of us who play both sides of that understand it. But I've always cautioned students that there is um, a huge burden that comes with charisma, and that's that you really do need to make sure that you know something when you say you know it and back it up. Because I'm always going to be held to a higher standard than anybody on TV. Well, that's fine. I'm willing to fight that. How do vets and dog trainers put their efforts into serious school studies, yet not have a detract from their time spent helping dogs in their training or veterinary practice? You know, this is the rock and the hard place that most vets feel. It's interesting that you feel exactly the constraint that they feel. Because how do they keep helping the population they're having, and how do they get enough knowledge to be able to do that? And it's one of the reasons that um, most continuing education meetings have um, these little short sessions for vets called pearls or um, you know top 10 tips because you're trying to give them some quick tools that they can use for a number of circumstances and just get them through it and the more rational approach is to backload this earlier and earlier so that we front load the whole thing so that you learn all of this quite early in your career uh, we are not there yet with dogs, you know, even for working dogs. There's nowhere that you can go to school to learn to be a dog handler. Well, or, you know, whichever, what, however you decide you're going to work them. If you go to work for guide dogs, for example, they'll teach you what they want. But is that right? But their schools are their schools. There's no overall curriculum from people who know the literature and are doing the research. So there's still this disconnect sort of between um, academia and the practitioners. And I don't care whether you're a practitioner like you, you know, somebody who's in that group of dog trainers with all of that education, or you're 
um, some working dog person, whether you work with a dog that is a mobility dog or a service dog for someone who's blind or a police dog or a detection dog or um, search and rescue dogs uh, or you're a vet who would like some information both about dog training because it would be awfully nice if somebody in that practice could actually teach animals to have nice manners or behavior problems. You know, we just don't know about those things. So everybody's trying to get that, that information and there's still this disconnect. And this is one of the things that I actually truly don't understand because nowhere in history have we had more access to resources than we have now. Um, if, if we were gonna have a clearinghouse approach to this, you would wanna use all of those media. You would wanna use online learning. You would wanna use go to meeting. You would want to use videos and CDs. You would want to use every aspect of that you can use. Most people's laptops have cameras in them now. You know, why couldn't a vet open up their laptop and say, this is the dog. Look at what this dog is doing. What do you think we should do? And reach out to somebody who um, maybe is at a university or has some training or put together consortiums of people who can who can give advice. And we ought to be getting universities interested in some relationships that will be profitable to everybody. The resistance you run into at the academic level is just what I said. I'm overburdened. Um, universities are paying their faculty to do certain things. Somehow there has to be um, some quid pro quo here. You know, how do we how do we work that out? Well, I think that arrangement is the thing that's holding us back. I think understanding how to do that. National Geographic's got it down pat. They charge for their magazine. They charge for their shows. It's a cable series, you know. Um, Animal Planet's got it down pat. Everybody in the world advertises on Animal Planet. So other people are paying for that information. Well, how do you pay for information that's vetted for quality? That's the one thing that I think is missing. And I think that um, if we could overcome that, uh, you'd get a lot more use of it. The Brits overcame it in one way because they ended up with a huge publicity campaign. So it was widely covered in the British press. So the press gave them the entree into saying, we have a credible source. You go to this website, you go to the dog welfare website, and now you can download all this information and get recommendations. How they'll sustain that is something else.